So let's get started. Uh, I should introduce myself to start with. My name is Norman Lamb. I was a member of parliament for 18 and a half years, representing uh, the wonderful area of North Norfolk. Uh, I was minister responsible for mental health between 2012 and 2015 in the coalition government. And I have an acute interest in mental health and in education. So I'm really looking forward to this evening's events. Um, I think it's fair to say that children's mental health is on the agenda, which is a positive thing. Uh, but in a way, it's there because of the psychological fallout from the COVID pandemic and the sense that it's probably hitting children and young people more heavily than any other part of uh, society. And we're conscious also of the increasing inequality that has been exposed as a result of the pandemic, including educational uh, inequality. Uh, we're also seeing the uh, evidence of that uh, uh, psychological fallout. A&E attendances across London, for example, up 30% amongst children and young people since the first lockdown. Uh, and that's all on top of an increasing trend in any event, which doubling over the last uh, five years. So there are issues out there which are causing very real uh, concern. Um, so the increased awareness of uh, mental ill health amongst young people is, is a positive thing, but there is also this sense that our response is still unsophisticated. The debate is too often just about how do we increase access to treatment without thinking about how we promote well-being, how we prevent mental ill health in the first place. And our response to behaviour, which is so often linked to uh, mental health issues, is also, in my view, remarkably stupid for a so-called sophisticated society. So uh, what happens too often is that we punish children for the experiences of life that they have been through, rather than seeking to understand uh, and to respond to those experiences to help that child to uh, flourish. And of course, enabling that to happen enables learning uh, to uh, be pursued by that uh, child. But instead of uh, that more sophisticated approach, what too often happens is that children end up being excluded from school, something that I'm horrified by. In my own county of Norfolk, I see large numbers of exclusions. And what happens then is that we are rejecting those children uh, and the outcomes for those children uh, then deteriorate. Uh, and too often, children in adulthood then end up with low educational attainment and too often, tragically, enter the criminal justice system. Uh, a better approach is desperately needed. And that's why I'm so fascinated by the new school. It takes a different approach to behaviour and mental health. It sees them as the flip side of the same coin. They're trying to tackle the root causes of behavioural issues and low educational engagement by building deep and trusting relationship between young people and staff. For example, instead of a behaviour policy, a punishment policy, they have a community accountability policy focused on restorative justice, a principle that I fundamentally believe in, and supported by empowered young people and staff who all hold one another to account. So in this webinar, we'll hear directly from a head teacher, from a parent, young people, uh, an expert psychotherapist, and finally from Lord Dennis Stevenson, a member of the House of Lords and a long-term mental health advocate, someone who I know and, uh, and value as a friend, I think it's fair to say, uh, very well. Uh, and we'll hear about the issue in schools and what could be done to improve young people's well-being. Now, please, uh, can I remind the audience that there will be time, hopefully, for questions at the end, if I can maintain the discipline on timing. 
so please post your questions in the chat function throughout the session so that we can feed them uh, into our speakers on the panel this evening. So I'd like to first of all uh, welcome uh, Lucy Stevens, director and co-head teacher of the new school, a non-fee-paying democratic school and a charity in Upper Norwood, South London. Lucy, over to you. Thanks, Norman. Um, hi, everyone. It's so great to be here tonight. Um, lovely to see so many people. Um, so I think, as Norman said, you know, young people's mental health has really been brought into the spotlight during this pandemic. And it's great that calls are being made nationwide for more resources to be brought into schools. But we shouldn't forget that mental health was a growing problem pre-COVID um, and simply calling for um, resources as an add-on to everyday school practices is missing a big piece of the puzzle. And that piece is looking at how some of the common practices within the education system already directly impact mental health. And I want to make the case that mental health and behaviour are inextricably intertwined. And yet within the school system, we often separate them. And that can have big consequences for young people. You know, we're told as educators that we should be on the lookout for behaviour that might indicate a mental health concern. But some behaviours are far easier to recognise and manage within a class setting than others. So, I mean, let's imagine Molly struggling with low mood, low confidence, low self-esteem. Her behaviour doesn't impact the rest of the class, doesn't disrupt teaching, but it's observable. And we can easily empathise with her. We know we're not triggered personally. And so it's easy to flag it as a mental health concern. But let's imagine Joe, who expresses his difficulties through more challenging behaviour, fighting, swearing, shouting out. And it's much harder to retain an empathetic lens in Joe's case because it's disruptive. And now, instead of also seeing the behaviour as communicating a mental health difficulty, we see it as rudeness or manipulation or insolence. And so logic dictates that it's a behaviour that needs to be dealt with firmly. So young people learn how to behave. And then we have a tendency to look at these challenging behaviours as, as simply social issues, you know, poor parenting, genetics, disadvantage, rather than also potential mental health issues. And, I, and so then it seems sensible to put a lot of effort into enforcing consequences and sanctions for poor behaviour, whilst also rewarding good behaviour so that young people are taught and incentivised to behave more appropriately. But does this work? You know, evidence shows that those with more challenging behaviour continue to be the same ones who escalate through ever increasing cycles of detention, isolation, suspension, exclusion. And I think we should seriously question this logic. You know, do we think young people honestly don't understand the norms of desirable behaviour, that they choose to behave in ways that single them out or that anger their peers or their teachers or parents? You know, if we know that mental health disorders in children are delays in developing age appropriate thinking, social skills or regulation of emotion, and all behaviour is communication, then it provides us a different lens, one that sees young people uh, who are struggling as not yet having developed certain skills, whether that's a skill of regulating emotions when frustrated, being flexible when plans change, or having the ability to interpret social cues accurately from peers. And so if a young person's behaviour is the result of underdeveloped skills, does it make sense to punish them for that? Or does it make more sense to work to address the root cause of the problem? And this is why mental health and behaviour are inextricably linked, two sides of the same coin. We have young people unable to meet adult expectations in a particular situation, discipline systems that exacerbate the problem, the underlying need or the underdeveloped skill doesn't get addressed, and the likelihood of mental health deteriorating increases. So what can we do in schools to support young people's mental health more effectively? We need to collaborate. And at the new school, we work on collaborative problem solving. So we work to identify all the different expectations with which a young person is having difficulty. And crucially, when we write it down, it's separate from the behavior. So we might write, you know, having difficulty when working independently in maths, not Joe punch Bobby in a math lesson. 
And we then take each difficulty one at a time and use it to open up a conversation with the young person. You know, I noticed it's hard for you to work on your maths by yourself at the moment. What's up? So that we really understand the problem from their perspective. And when we know that the reason that Joe disrupts the lesson during maths is because he doesn't understand our explanation and doesn't want us to and doesn't want to tell us that, um, you know, in, he doesn't understand in front of his peers because they'll think he's stupid. Then we can work on a mutual solution with Joe that addresses both his need to understand the instructions and not be embarrassed in front of peers and our need to stop him disrupting the class when we're trying to teach. And here I think we also see the futility of forcing young people into a standard model of discipline, disciplinary procedures, because how would a detention solve Joe's problem or our problem for that matter? And just to be clear, the solution is not to have no expectations in the classroom or no routine. I'm talking about working together with a young person to accommodate their needs when they can't meet certain expectations and get our concerns addressed at the same time. It's about personalising expectations, exactly the same way you would as if a young person was struggling with reading. And at the same time as working proactively to address challenging behaviour, we also work reactively to address harm when it does occur, because conflict is a natural part of life, but through principles of restorative justice. So how do we bring more collaboration into schools? I can hear all the teachers on this saying, that's wonderful, but when do we have the time to do these one-to-one -one conversations? And I totally get it. You know, as an independent school, albeit a non-fee paying one, you know, we do have the luxury of a more flexible timetable, but we also have to work really hard to make time in the school day for this. So if we're starting, you know, calls are starting to have greater resource for mental health directed towards schools, this is where I think it's better placed. And so a final few thoughts on making space for collaboration. You know, firstly, work to create a culture of collaborative problem solving at the level of the group and not just the individual. Everyone has needs, everyone has strengths and weaknesses and creating a class culture that works together through perhaps through morning circles and um, to solve problems and support each other is crucial. And it creates a less judgmental space that includes those with more obvious challenges. Secondly, collaborate as a staff team to prioritise the time for informal and one-to-one -one catch ups with young people. You know, it might be sitting together at lunch, it might be creating a gap for self-directed learning time when adults and young people can come together as partners, or finding 15 minutes to cover a lesson for a colleague whilst, you ca whilst they catch up with a young person. And thirdly, create a reflective practice group as educators. Working collaboratively can be really hard, messy, uncomfortable, because we bring our own triggers and our own preconceptions of behaviour and discipline, especially when we're challenging conventional wisdom that says young people need to be taught the right way to behave. It requires teamwork, patience and tenacity. You know, we're constantly practising, messing it up, trying again but read together, understand child development and work to change the lenses through which you see behaviour and look for the communication and the need underneath the behaviour, however shocking that behaviour is. And finally, look long and hard at your school discipline policy. So many behaviour policies exacerbate and in many cases create mental health problems in the first place. Accountability is not about paying the price for actions. It's about participating in a process that identifies and articulates everyone's concerns, takes everyone's needs into account, and together working towards a realistic solution, which is a far more effective way to hold people accountable. And it's a far more effective at addressing mental health needs and challenging behavior. Lucy, that was absolutely fascinating uh, and enlightened uh, in, a, in, in a wonderful way. So thank you so much. And the great and positive news is that we're on time. <laughs> so the discipline is holding at the moment. Uh, now we have a, a wonderful opportunity to hear from a Pupil Power Young People panel. Now, Pupil Power is a fully youth-led organisation, and uh, we're going to welcome Akia, Dylan, Aya and Catherine. And I think I'm handing over to Akia uh, to start things off. Akia? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Norman. Um, I'd like to briefly, um, again, just start off with the questions that we have for our young people. And I know that timing is an important issue. So 
I'd like to start off with the following, just the introductory question of, is behavior and mental health linked? Um, I'll start off if you don't mind, Akira. So in my opinion, there's a massive link between behavior and mental health. As Lucy was saying in the beginning, a lot of behavior is fueled by our mental health. And the thing is with mental health, it's such an individual thing, even though it can be very stereotyped like a lot of other things um, that we experience. I think a lot of people within school settings, they still uh, stereotype as things like depression, like being very much visible when you look at someone even though it can it is a psychological thing we don't realize how individual things can be and the behaviors that come from mental health are so individual to everyone and it can present in many ways it can present in students being overachieving and very high achieving or having more aggressive behaviors or being very antisocial and I think it's very important that we notice that it's not something that's the same for every single person. Um, I think that mental health and behaviour in schools are linked um, because it's a it's a very it's a, to me it's a very clear thing to notice and I also do think um, that race plays a factor in mental health as well. Um, for example, uh, black boys are three times more likely to be excluded. Um, if you have a student who is um, SEN and, and black, you know, the system, the education system is automatically against, um, you know, those people. And so we have to find ways of focusing our um, focusing our rehabilitation and our um, our empathy to those people that the system doesn't like. So I think, yeah. Those are some um, really insightful answers. Thank you um, for answering so well, both of you. Um, and the second question is more about you could even say the title of the webinar. And it's, should we consider behavior and mental health as two sides of the same point? And if not, why? I think that we definitely should be considering behavior and mental health as two sides of the same coin. Because when we look at the school system right now, I, well, with my experience at least, it was very much focused on outcome and results and that had a massive effect on us as students and it affected our mental health, whether that be um, students suffering with low mood, depression, anxiety, and still trying to get results and get work done, or whether it was students that saw that we were only valued for our results and just decided that they didn't care anymore. And they thought, I think a lot of people that I know and myself, to be honest, um, got to a point where we thought we were being, we based our own self-worth around grades. And that has a huge impact on so many students in so many different ways. I've known people who have gotten to a point of burnout where they've been very good students and very consistent and seen as high achievers, if you will. Um, but because they've always put that pressure on themselves to achieve and a lot of people just didn't notice that they were going through mental health issues because they a lot of teachers would look at them and see that see that they were getting good grades doing their homework they got to a point where they couldn't take the pressure anymore and it was kind of breaking point for them and then they weren't getting those results in, anymore and that was the only point where teachers would actually notice that something was going on and by that point it's too late in a lot of cases um, for me throughout all of secondary school I was going through a lot of mental health issues but I was someone who masked it a lot because I was seen as someone who was a high achiever 
and no one really noticed till year 11 when I, all of a sudden I wasn't really coming in school as much um, and I wasn't putting as much effort into things and I think a huge part of the school system right now is that it feels like we it feels like they don't care about our mental health and that's what makes it so much worse a lot of the time and that's what can have a huge effect on our behavior and how we are in school um, yeah I completely agree with um Dylan I I um yeah so I see mental health and um the school system is like two sides of the same coin um because I, I personally think that the education system is the indoctrination of the young. And, and um, what I mean by that is that, um, um, I'm going to talk about politics now, so excuse me. Um, but what I mean by that is um, the capitalist system designs an education, um, which, um, if you like, is full of propaganda and filters out what we what um what is known as um people who have behavioral issues these people um will not conform with, with the system and so and so have to be um kicked out now the ones who do remain um obviously are put through a lot of pace and put through a lot of pressure um to get certain grades and to adhere to the rules. Um, this all subconsciously, um, because a lot of it is subconscious, uh, contribute um, is detrimental to our mental health. And I think if we remove the capitalist system, um, if we if we remove it and then focus on the education by itself, you know, it's a it's a very small thing, the education, but the education system but it also plays a huge role in the propaganda and indoctrinating young adults so when they become um when they are older you know we're gonna be full of propaganda and so we're gonna um we are going to uh we're going to be more more, more obedient and passive but also we would we will um believe in an illusion that you know everything's um open and everything's great and you know everything's fine when it's not okay um that was a lot to take in from both of you guys i really do um, understand where you guys are coming from we do have um limited time so i'm going to ask you the final question a little bit of quick fire answers what more do you think that schools can do to help students with behavioural issues? Um, I think a massive part of it is normalising, intertwining mental health education throughout uh, the whole curriculum, rather than having like a week focused on uh, mental health or just having a lesson here and there, because we don't know enough as students. We don't know how to spot early warning signs that our well-being is going downhill um i think a lot of the things that we are taught about is kind of the more extreme sides and there's not enough focus put on the early warning signs of um spiraling mental health um i think that question um is a complicated question um I personally think that the education system um, um, cares about our mental health because to a certain extent, we have to do um, the work, we have to do the labour, but we can't do it if we're so burnt out mentally. And so as long as we're mentally capable of doing um, the work, then that's going to be fine. It doesn't really matter. I'd like to say thank you guys so much for answering the questions and we'll be handing over to Norman now. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> that's brilliant. And you've kept the time showing extraordinary discipline. So thank you, Akir, Dylan and Aya. Uh, really insightful 
uh, and fascinating uh, section. So thank you all so much. Again, I just remind the audience, if you want to ask a question at the end, shove it in the chat function now or whenever you want to so that we can spot it and, uh, and identify it. Thanks very much. Now, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Keita Adams. Uh, Keita is a parent uh, whose 10 year old son attends the new school. Uh, are you there, Keita? Hi, Norman. Can you see me? Wonderful. Hi. It's working. <laughs> so, Keita, as a parent, what do you think are some of the reasons mental health appears to be a growing problem amongst young people? I think it's a societal issue. I think that there's a lot of socioeconomic um, deprivation. There's a lot of societal pressures that come from living in the digital age. Everything's about social media these days. So a lot of young people place a lot of emphasis on sort of comparing themselves to, a, a, in many ways, an unattainable image and dream of what they should be, rather than focus on who they are and, and appreciating who they are. And that just you know, sets up a, long, a, a lot of young people to develop some serious anxiety issues, issues with depression. I just think also in terms of the school system, things like the SAT. Well, I was going to ask you, uh, Keita, how do you think schools sort of help or hinder young people in terms of their well-being? OK, in terms of hinder, I think a lot of the curriculum is based upon achieving, att attaining certain results. It's about being assessed to see if children meet a certain level. And for a lot of children, they cannot cope with that type of pressure. My 10 year old in particular, he had SATs in year two and he, he basically crumbled and fell apart. He couldn't deal and cope with the pressure of being assessed in such a formal way. Um, I think that a lot of the times education is put on the back burner and it's about filling in forms, filling in sheets. Um, meeting certain criteria. What about what about the curriculum? Are the children enjoying what they're learning at school? Is the curriculum dynamic? Is it varied? Um, I think it's improved in the in the last few years. But, and, and what do, would you like overall to see change uh, in order to be more effective at uh, facilitating young people's well-being? And I guess it, would you also agree that uh, if we're more sophisticated in responding to behaviour? Uh, we actually facilitate learning rather than it being an either or. Yes, absolutely. I think that self-awareness is very important. I think that the, um, you know, the schools need to keep engaging with the parents and the carers and the families. Um, I felt that I was engaged with really well with the schools that my son attended. The communication, the line of communication was very transparent. And that definitely, that's something that we have to keep building on and improving and working on. I think a lot of families feel alienated when their children are falling apart at school. There's stigma at the end. There is, we've come a long way, but there's still a lot of stigma surrounding mental health. I know that I struggled for a long time with my son's issues. I didn't know how to approach it. I didn't know who to reach out to, to get that support, to, to start building those bridges with his teachers, with practitioners. And um, it's taken a while, but it's, we've so yeah, well, it's fascinating, Keita. What have you found that's different about the new school to other schools that you've experienced? And perhaps give an example of something that they've done that stands out for you as, uh, as sort of telling in terms of their approach. Well, for me, the new school is a community. It's not about teachers and children. It's a collaborative, open, transparent community where the children's voices are heard. I mean, when they come through the school gates in the morning, they have a breakfast, they sit down and have the morning circle, which is a really important part of the day. And it gives your, the children the opportunity to talk about their feelings, about maybe some concerns they may have, and to just share stories about what's going on in their lives with their, with their classmates and with the teachers. So for me, it's just there's a fluidity about being in, in the school. You know? and look, because we're running out of time, just a final very quick uh, question for you. Yeah. What message would you want to send to leaders and politicians about how education needs to change and how we need to support well-being more effectively? Um, I think we need to look at opening more new schools around the country. <laughs> that would and, be amazing. <laughs> and, and you weren't paid anything to say that, were you? No, no. I mean, the new school is an amazing, amazing, it's just 
a, a, a one of, one in a lifetime opportunity for our family and I just think that the the government should be more open to supporting schools like the new school well, so they, they become the norm I guess that's that's wonderful thank you so much Keita thank great you. to hear from you thank you and I'd now like to introduce Alexandra Matakovic uh, Manka uh, Alexandra is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist over to you Alexandra You're muted, I think. Sorry. Thank you, Norman, for introducing me. Thank you, Lucy, for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure because I'm very passionate about mental health and education um, as well. And um, we all know how much children's mental health has become a priority, especially lately, and that now the new data from the NHS is that one in six people has a probable um, mental health problem and we also know that a lot of um, people are not able to access services appropriately and that even in the data show that 26 percent of referrals are being rejected but we also know that a lot of it's also difficult to get a referral from the GP and that those referrals that are rejected kept you know a lot of people I've seen working in camps have tried to get help um, early on and maybe for five, six years before being able to actually access a service. So the last data are saying that only 25% of people needing help are actually receiving it. And one of the, the problem are, is also that a lot of the times, as Lucy was pointing out for, for regarding school, it also relates to mental health services that behavioral problems or behavioral presentations are not considered mental health or are not considered serious or as a form of communication. So people are often rejected um, because of that. Or um, even if that is considered an issue, the services are often not able to um, address that because the treatment they provide is not, um, is not adequate. For some of these young people. One of the things I've seen is that, and I truly believe that school is has the potential to be an incredible resource preventatively and also towards recovery, to, to promote recovery for young people. I've seen all um, um, ends of the spectrum in, in how when having a good conversation with teachers who were able to attend the meetings to understand better young people who maybe have been excluded on a number of times, they were able to turn around the situation and, 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 the, and from the young person and that family completely. And like Kita was also saying, if, if the school is providing a sense of belonging and a sense of community and a sense of understanding, things can really change um, completely. I think at the base of that is, is what Lucy was pointing out um, as the base of, of the new school is a relational practice. And we know that even for cases of, of high levels of trauma or high levels of distress, if there is one person that has a significant relationship with, with the young person, that can be a sole and even unique factor that can prevent um, the development of severe mental health issues or deterioration. So having a good relationship and being able to develop that, it's, it's so crucial. And I think the base of that, it lies on understanding. I know that I've just learned actually recently that teachers are, do not have in their training any teaching on development, on behavior, on mental health, and on even the adverse um, childhood experiences and how that can be mitigated. So I think that looking forward, the training of teacher and the support of teachers needs to be really, really crucial because when teachers understand what is going on and, and how that can be addressed, they don't even need, um, some young people don't even need mental health support because that can already, there is an innate capacity of of healing that we each of us have and even that teacher can find solutions when they feel listened to and when they feel that they can understand they have the resources to know even intuitively what to what to do and how to help the young person 
but that time needs to be allocated for that. I've, I don't know how many times I stressed organizing meetings with schools and, and for, the, for a young person, and then the, maybe the school lead would attend and the Senko, but not the teachers who are actually dealing with the young person. So I think making time for the people who are actually interacting with the young person to be there in the meeting and to have a reflective space and to have a better understanding makes a huge, a huge difference. So the integration between resources and services is really um, fundamental. There are also great examples in which detention has been substituted with reflective and relational spaces and and those schools have completely changed the level of attainment and achievement that have greatly increased in uh, in those settings. And so that's a great example and a lot of evidence about um, about this to base our practice. Um, and I also wanted to touch on what Dylan was saying on uh, on how a lot of young people for how things are now and for how the school system is based um, have their self-esteem depending a lot on on grades because that is almost the only thing that is being tested but a lot of people actually have different kinds of learning and have a lot of resources that could be valued in different ways and so that also would just make such a huge difference if that could be um another area of focus and and if 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 there was an understanding on how people learn differently and how that can be valued i'm sure there are a lot of questions coming there and so look forward for the q and a thank you Ale alexandra that was absolutely brilliant and thank you for your discipline as well on timing uh, now it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, lord dennis stevenson uh, an old mate um, I managed to persuade uh, Dennis Stevenson to uh, come onto the board of a wonderful organisation called Think Ahead, which is about training people in uh, mental health social work. So it's great to see you again, Dennis. What was it that originally interested you in mental health? Oh, there we are. Um, the, the, oh, by the way, if you call me Lord Stevenson again, I'm going to ask you to touch a <laughs> forelock. <laughs> I, I love being a law, but I, I like being called Dennis. Um, uh, the, the answer is aged. Well, I'm very old. When I, when I was about 50, I realized I suffered from what uh, is called clinical depression. Although in truth, there isn't an adequate definition of clinical depression. But to put it crudely, um, I, I felt lousy. And, I spent and this is presumably in the middle of doing a pretty significant job, was it? A very significant job, and it's and um, that's a, that's a whole the whole question the the number of people doing significant jobs who suffer from yeah. um, mental health is it's it's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, anyway, so I I got involved through personal experience. I lived through it, learnt to cope, learnt that you don't quote cure it, um, that it's life, um, and learnt to live with it. Um, so that, that that's how I and, I and then gradually got sucked into doing more as I learned more. Good. That's excellent. And what are your reflections, Dennis, not Lord, Dennis, uh, <laughs> on what you've heard this evening? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I've been riveted and I'm, and congratulations to the new school for organising this. I can imagine that Lucy and her co-head have, and staff have quite a lot to do and to entrepreneur that's motivated is fantastic and it shows it sends a sign of your priorities so great for that and I love the just very simple little thing I love the notion Keita talked about them having breakfast and then a circle a circle where they could talk about their 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 feelings etc etc just a very simple thing but that sounded terrific uh, now in terms of Mental health, children, school, etc. I have the basic uh, following observation. If any of us went out in the street and stopped the first person we saw and said, how's your mental health? I would predict that nine or seven out of 10 people, probably nine, would think they were t t talking about an illness. And I think that hits at the rub of what as a society we need to change, which is, 
if they said, how's your physical health? They wouldn't think that at all. And I wasn't brought up to realize I got mental health. Um, I regret to say I didn't bring my children up to think they got mental health. <laughs> my grandchildren don't have a chance. <laughs> and I, I think the really important thing is for every, all of us to realize we got mental health and to learn how to deal with it and to learn how to cope. And yes, there will be um, situations where you people are very ill indeed and need very special attention. But for the vast majority of people who are suffering, as we, as Paul Farmer and I said in our report for the Prime Minister, struggling, um, if you've been properly socialized and brought up, you can learn tricks or help get help from other people um, to deal with it. So translating that onto the school scene, I remember when computers started hitting schools, they brought in the, the, the powers that be, brought in a system of every school having to have an IT literate teacher. Now, I think we're moving that way, but I think every school should have a mental health literate teacher. Does that mean a professional specialist? No. It means a human being who's, who's got some tricks of the trade, understands things, is a good mentor and helper. So that, that would be, but basically this be, has been a fantastic discussion. And by, by the way, Akia got away with chairing his discussion without giving us his views. I think at some point he should be forced to give us his views because he looks <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, absolutely right. Uh, but uh, Dennis, I mean, we've heard uh, of, of such an enlightened uh, and a bit more of a sophisticated approach uh, from the new school today. How do we get people in positions of power and influence to get to understand this and to move away from a rather blunt instrument of, of punishment for behaviour that may well have something to do with someone's uh, uh, own mental health or their emotional circumstances? Well, first of all, I am quite optimistic. If, you, if I compare what's happening now in society as a whole and in schools in particular, with how it was when my children went to school, I think it's been a definite improvement. Mental health is out of the closet. Um, I, I have not found myself stigmatized over the last 20, 30 years um, by talking about my own mental health. And I personally think there are more and more schools, more and more teachers who are doing what I'm describing, who are taking an interest in it. So uh, the short answer is, I, I, I mean, if I, I think that, and I don't know, it may be they're doing it, but I don't think so. Uh, rather in the way that 20 years ago, the government today required all schools to have an ICT specialist teacher who had, wasn't a great specialist, wasn't a computer nerd, but went away on the odd course. And I think all schools should have a teacher who is personally interested in, in mental health and knows a bit more than most of us, and who has a job to see what's happening in the school. Um, I think that if that leads to there being more sessions for parents, for children, to talk about their own mental health, to get across the message that it is everyone's got mental health, that it's normal to be down in the dumps. I mean, we said in our report, people either thrive or struggle. Yeah. We all struggle at various points. And sometimes people are very ill. But most often, it's people struggling. And the notion of, and it sounds to me as the new school's trying to do this, a community where people talk openly about how they're feeling and what's happening to them and can help each other. It's that direction. But I'm quite optimistic. I think we're moving in the right direction. Well, Dennis, it, it's been wonderful hearing from you again. Thank you for your uh, insightful words. Yeah. Uh, and um, it, it's great to see you looking very well. Uh, enjoying life <laughs> in Suffolk you. despite everything. So look, we've got to that point now in the evening's uh, agenda where it's a, a panel Q &A and A uh, and, and some questions are being fed through to me uh, in the chat function um, for me to put to the panel. But let me ask, first of all, how, how can this, is, and this relates particularly to the brilliant uh, pupil power power panel uh, ha someone has asked how can we amplify your voice so that more people can hear what you have to say so can one of the young people perhaps Akia um, Dennis challenge you Akia to give some of your thoughts so uh, are you up for it I'm up for it yeah I'm excellent it. I thought you might be um, in terms of how we can amplify young people's voices I think 
we have to go back to the basics. We definitely have to listen to what they have to say. And it isn't necessarily putting them in, putting them in a room and asking them a list of questions in a survey. I think it's through conversation and actually having that dynamic where it's not necessarily a power struggle or something that they feel as if they can't say. And that's the fear that keeps them disruptive or that's the fear that keeps them disengaged. You need to have a, um, a comfortable report with that student or the group of students that you have to even get their real feelings and thoughts across. And then to amplify those voices, you need to create systems and structures that they trust and they feel as if my voice, will, my voice will be heard. I think it's the easier the easier it is for a student to understand than the better. Instead of having 500 people you need to talk to and they each need to correspond with one another. If it's a simple system where it could be if you let your form tutor know, then your form tutor and your head of year, for example, will all have a sit down. And it's not something that's locked away in a room. It's something even potentially your parent can be invited to if you feel as if you're comfortable with that. But it's something that is where it's a little bit more community focused as opposed to we're only here to find out if you have an issue, if it's to do with your academics. Because again, I think the inclusion of the parents as well is very important because everyone experiences mental health and some people, some unfortunately their parents are just as ignorant as the child sometimes and through no fault of their own. So it's, well, yeah. Akia, that's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much uh, for your response. And uh, you, you will have satisfied Dennis by uh, giving your uh, insight there. Now, this is an interesting one from my point of view, um, because I happen now to chair the South London and Maudsley uh, NHS Foundation Trust, which is a mental health trust covering Croydon, where uh, the new school is based. But the question is, how can schools and mental health services work uh, more effectively together. Who would like to uh, try to answer that question? Alexandra, perhaps, or, or Lucy? Yes. What? Alexandra, you first. I'm I'm happy um, to go because I think one of the issues, the extreme fragmentation, and being you know a lot of services and a lot of schools and and voluntary organization i've seen that question you know doing great things but it's all like disjointed and not working together and i think that time needs to be made for for that work to actually be together be jointed and go in the same direction because otherwise it's a lot of resources just being wasted and not put together in the same in the same um direction so probably I mean just if we just focus about time um, you know and just make time for example for mental health services to have the meetings with school with the relevant people or with any other service that is involved with that young person I think it's just crucial to have that understanding. That's fantastic Lucy. Yeah I think I would literally just echo um, Alex it's the disjointed nature you know it's <clears throat> one team that deals with a safeguarding issue and when it's not no longer a safeguarding issue you're then with a different team because it's now an education issue and then when it's not an education issue and you know um, and as schools we bounce between those different things um and you know you're back to the bottom of a waiting list again and it's it's really tricky to to bring that team around a young person so i think fantastic thank you uh, here's one for Keita. Uh, as a parent what would you say is the difference in your relationship with staff at the new school as opposed to previous schools? Um, it's not that different. I just think that it's more collaborative. I feel like as a parent, I'm part of a, a, a community where um, I just feel in, more involved. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm quite proactive, but I just feel like that when I speak to the teachers every day and I engage with them, there's that sense of empowerment there and it's transferred from my son onto me, which is not something you would necessarily get. Well, that's just my personal opinion. I don't know how other people feel about it in a, in a mainstream setting. It's very much about, oh, that's the teacher, you're the parent. But I just feel there's more collaboration as a parent at the new school. That, that's my sense in a way. Thank you, Keita, that's great. And I, this one perhaps particularly for Lucy, but perhaps also one of the young people, uh, asking the right questions is crucial. What is the effect of the school structure, practices and environment on both mental health and behaviour? 
Lucy? Um, I think I think for us it's everything. Like we have to make the structures that support young people's voice. Otherwise, I don't understand how we can really support teaching and learning because you don't really understand what the needs are or what the interests are or what the um, you know the I, I don't yeah so I think so I think that's what we really work hard to do so young people's feedback putting them front and center and then as adults our role is to really understand that um, and in order to meet their needs but probably Dylan's got or I yeah no I'm pleased to see Dylan's hands up over to you Dylan yeah, I think adding on to what Lucy said, definitely talking to the students about mental health and what's most useful for them, because from my experience, when I guess teachers started getting more concerned about me in year 11, because they saw my grades dropping and they saw my attendance dropping, their automatic reaction was, OK, um, we're referring you to CAMS now. And in my head, it was just like, OK, what's this? What is, why don't I get a say over this? And for me, that experience in year 11 actually made me a lot worse. And I, especially with, again, that disjointed nature, because once they referred me to CAMS, school were kind of just like, okay, this is CAMS problem now. Um, but I was there every day, kind of going to the safeguarding team, like, look, I don't like this. It's not helping me. Can you give me something that will help me? And I think that was a massive part in why I got to a point where I didn't really trust my school as much anymore. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna close off again. That was my only choice because I felt like I wasn't being helped. And I think the need for student inclusion and student feedback is so fundamental in actually trying to improve our mental health and like going into behavior as well. And yeah. So it's a fascinating answer, Dylan. And what you're saying in a sense is that the response from the system actually set you back rather than helping you yeah definitely like I think if I had a lot more choice over it back then I would have been a lot further now um, in my kind of mental health journey thank you so much uh, another question here is too much testing an issue uh, anyone on the panel would like to respond to that. I can see some nodding of the head from Keita there. Um, uh, Keita or Lucy, do you want to come in and respond to that? Keita. If you like, I do um, make an observation. Taking, would... Hang on, I'll bring you in in a second. Go, Keita. Is Keita first. No, I mean, I just, as I pointed out before, when I spoke to you before, Norman, I think there is a, a, a major emphasis on testing. I'm not aware, is, is streaming, is the streaming still, does a tier system still happen, particularly in the secondary schools where um, students are tiered off from year seven? I don't know much about it, but I think that definitely that's going to affect, you know, the mental health of the child, because they feel that everything's about testing and assessments and being able to sort of, I don't know, cope with that level of expectation, so. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Keita. Now, Dennis, over to you. No, I mean, I'd, I'd love to introduce other questions. I, I thought you had a gap, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm happy to come back on testing. Uh, I'm basically, same to say, that there's nothing wrong with testing per se, and it's uh, we'll chuck the baby out of the bathwater if we get too negative about it. It's just how it's handled and how it's managed, but that's a, it's a big discussion. Thank you, Dennis. Now, here's a question directly for Lucy. Could Lucy speak to directing influence away from grades to the individual and striking that balance as educators? Um, I think that's a massive change that needs to happen within the system. Absolutely. Um, but it comes back to we treasure what we measure. And if we simply only measure schools by standardised test scores, then that is what schools will end up skewing towards. Um, so at the new school, we've actually created an alternative outcomes framework. So we um, we measure four key outcomes. You know, academic skills are implicit in what we do for young people to have a sense of agency, but they're the, not the direct thing that we measure. Um, obviously, we do measure progress and uh, uh, 
understand exactly where young people are at that's just good education and it's good teaching um but it's not the main steer of what we do but i i guess lucy you would say would you that you facilitate learning by an individual child by uh, responding to them in a more effective way yeah i think we work really hard on inclusive teaching practices and and really um understanding where young people are at in their learning and finding space for more autonomy within that um, so that the you know learning is more interesting but it's also um, everybody can ac access it um, <clears throat> and then much more focus on formative assessment um, and you know where it's relevant some summative testing but it's not you know it's not the big drama of SATs because we're not measured on the results of what we're doing it because it's useful and purposeful for a teacher to move forward with learning. Thank you. Uh, now, Alexandra, there's a question here for you. Do you think that community and voluntary organisations could help to fill the gap in demand? This is, I, I guess, pressure of uh, mental health issues amongst uh, young people and the services, the traditional treatment services, simply not coping. And of course, we don't want to over pathologise uh, children's uh, mental ill health issues or mental distress, do we? Yes, yes, I agree. I mean, I think that community services and voluntary organization are, I mean, one great thing that they're doing is that they're focusing on well-being and focusing on what, what makes people feel better. And, and I think they could actually fill a lot that gap. But again, that the, the offer needs to be integrated and there needs to be an understanding of what is going on for that person and then integrate it with the school where they spend a lot of time and, and with other services if they're involved. But I think that what they're doing in, in um, focusing on well-being very often is that that's where we need to look at and that's what we need to focus and also like help people understand how their system works and how their minds work and that and that human struggle it's part of every every human being again is so it's like also normalizing the experiencing and helping them find the resources that they feel it's more helpful rather than than people deciding for them thank you uh, now we're moving towards the end of our time but i wanted to also ask are there any examples internationally or within the uk beyond of course the new school which is a clear uh, example of good practice but that we can gain inspiration from lucy uh, would you point to anything that we can learn from uh, internationally or with, across the UK? Um, <clears throat> that's always tricky. I think um, anybody, um, honestly, in a lot of times, a very good, well-run alternative provision because it provides the relational model. Um, and any school that's working from an attachment focus, um, trauma-informed, because they tend to focus on relationships at the heart, um, and then there's lots of examples of more democratic schools that give young people more of a voice. They tend to be fee paying. Um, and a lot of schools now that recognise the importance of restorative justice, I think. And anyone that prioritises <laughs> that. I mean, if I was a parent, the first thing I would do would be to read someone's behaviour policy if I was making a decision about schooling. Thank you very much. Or even not calling it a behaviour policy, as you indicated uh, earlier. And are there any quick wins, any actions that could be taken very simply by government or Ofsted or anyone else uh, or schools individually that could really move the dial on how we respond to behaviour and children's well-being as they grow up? Um, I'm sorry to call talk, a, yeah, um, yeah, do come in, do come in. I personally think that we can't talk about mental health until um, the capitalist system is abolished because if we look at it it's like mental health is a, is a really radical thing for, for capitalists to talk about and it's all fine to sit here and talk about mental health but we need to we need to take action because throughout history we've been talking about mental health and we need action we need more diversity among adults talking about mental health um, I think the time of, like for talking is now over because we're just repeating the same thing throughout history and history. Like, when are when are we gonna um, when are we gonna actually act and when can we see more diverse 
ad adult diverse spaces within, within the adults community, you know, like BIPOC, um, people who are black, when can we hear those voices and act on those voices? Uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Well, look, I'm afraid uh, we're out of time. Although, Akia, do you want to say just something very, very quickly there? Oh, yeah, very, very quickly. Um, just wanting to say that, again, creating those spaces, so whether it be hiring a team, a mental health team that is engaged across the schools, providing more funding to services like CAMS so they can increase their outreach, just small, quick wins, but I... I'm conscious of the lack of time. 